talk about this is New Jersey Democratic Senator Bob Menendez. He is the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and a member of the Finance Committee. Senator, it is a pleasure to see you, sir. This is, talk to us about this framework. Is this something that you're willing to support? Uh, well, Jose, it's good to be with you. Congratulations on your show. Uh, you, look, uh, I'm certainly excited uh, to see some of the initiatives uh, in the framework. But, you know, the administration has obviously come to a deal with Senator Manchin and Cinema, uh, and now has to come to deal with the rest of the Senate. Uh, so, you know, uh, I look forward to seeing the specifics of the deal is, you know, I've been around long enough to know that what's in the legislation is critically important. Um, I uh, am concerned that there are a couple of provisions that I think are incredibly uh, necessary that I don't see in the framework, but that doesn't mean we can't uh, achieve them. You know, um, uh, we, we have to deal with the question of uh, unfairness uh, to states uh, under the SALT uh, provisions. Uh, I still want to find a way forward uh, to deal with uh, the cost of prescription drugs, which I have been working with Chairman Wyden on. Uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to see uh, how we can get there. But at least this framework is, a, is an opportunity to get to the final goal. But you have uh, you're hopeful that maybe some of the things that apparently aren't in it could be added. Yeah, I'm, I am hopeful that uh, some of the elements that, you know, uh, I care about and many others. Uh, how do we lower the cost of prescription drugs? How do we uh, ultimately find a pathway on uh, uh, some degree of immigration reform? How do we create relief for states like mine that ultimately donate to the federal treasury? If we, if we want states like New Jersey to continue to be an economic powerhouse that helps the federal treasury to fund some of these programs, then you gotta help us be able to be in that position. The SALT deduction is one of those elements. Mm -hmm. And, Senator, we're seeing uh, some images uh, just moments ago. Apparently, the president has wrapped up his, his meetings on, on Capitol Hill. I want to turn to uh, the increasing tensions between China and Taiwan. Taiwan's president sat down for an interview with CNN. Here's some of what she had to say, Senator. Do you have faith that the United States would defend Taiwan if the mainland were to try to move on Taiwan? I do have faith, and uh, given the long-term relationship that we have the U.S. We have uh, a wide range of cooperation with the U.S. Uh, uh, aiming at uh, uh, increasing our defense capability. How many U.S. service members are deployed in Taiwan right now? Um, not as many as uh, uh, people thought. Now, Senator, we know China has launched a number of new warships, flown dozens of bombers, fighters near Taiwan in recent months. And again, I just want to point out these are live images right now. The president and Nancy Pelosi as they wrap up that uh, that meeting. And he is uh, clearly just heading out back uh, to uh, head back to the White House. Uh, Senator, back to the issue of Taiwan. What should the U.S. be doing to help Taiwan? What message should the Biden administration be sending to China? Well, the message should be clear and unequivocal uh, that changing the status of Taiwan uh, uh, by force is simply unacceptable and, and will not be tolerated. Uh, I think that uh, I've been reviewing the Taiwan Relations Act, and it's amazing, though, even though it was uh, created several decades ago, it is wide-ranging enough for us to be able to help Taiwan uh, in ways that can deter China's aggression. For example, we can advance uh, the military uh, supplies that Taiwan needs, the equipment it needs, to make it very clear that it would be very costly to China to try to seek an invasion of it. Uh, we are in the midst uh, of helping Taiwan uh, join international organizations uh, in which its status becomes clearer and more difficult for China to abuse. Uh, we are uh, in the midst of understanding that Taiwan is a significant semiconductor uh, producer. Uh, that that is important to the world, and the world cannot tolerate uh, that China would ultimately take over Taiwan and, in doing so, uh, could have a stranglehold in the production of semiconductors, So, uh, which is in about everything that uh, we use. Uh, so uh, these are some of the ways in which we can engage and help Taiwan. We can help it militarily. Uh, we can help it in training. Uh, we can help it uh, in equipment. We can help it in the international 
international forums. We can help it in a global effort to make sure that more countries um, acknowledge Taiwan uh, and help us uh, continue to have it in international fora. You know, it's important to kind of underline the fact that there are elections in Taiwan. People live uh, in a system uh, where their leaders can be elected freely. That's so different that China and it's just, you know, we have to kind of remember that. And Senator, I want to turn back to the reconciliation bill. According to what we understand from the White House, this new framework includes a $100 billion investment to reform our immigration system. What's your understanding of that? My understanding is that that provision uh, is uh, in the uh, framework. My understanding also is that Speaker Pelosi and House Democrats uh, will have that uh, in the legislation that they ultimately pass and that the House is actually going to send us a registry date uh, uh, provision uh, to effectuate that part of the immigration reform. Uh, those are... Those are all um, good things, but of course, you know, as always, as I say, the devil's in the detail, but they're, they're good uh, bellwethers uh, of um, uh, Democrats seeking to find a pathway forward on immigration. We're still a long way there because of the Senate parliamentarian, uh, but we uh, have uh, a, a mission not to take uh, no for an answer. And, Senator, I know you've been uh, keeping a very close watch on what is going on in Cuba. 15th of November, there are planned protests asking once again for freedom. How do you see that? It is the right of the Cuban people, as it is the right of people anywhere, to peacefully protest uh, their grievances and to seek change. Uh, we saw what the Cuban regime did in the last peaceful protest that spread throughout the island, not only in Havana with the San Isidro movement led by Afro-Cubans, but from every part of the country there were protests. Those protests have now been called for once again. Now, uh, what we need to do is to make sure that the regime understands that there are consequences for the, any brutality that they create, as they did the last time, against peaceful protesters or the arrests of peaceful protesters, as they did with hundreds of peaceful protesters. Magnitsky Act sanctions. I think we have to, you know, I know the administration has been engaged in trying to find ways to create internet connectivity. We need to be able to do that because the regime shuts down uh, the internet when they are fearful of their own people, which is the only reason a regime would shut down the internet. Um, and we also have to push internationally so that the cries of the Cuban people are heard, not just by the, uh, the United States, but by countries throughout the world. That's why I've been challenging some of our uh, countries in the European Union. That's why I'm glad that a series of parliamentarians who chair their foreign relations committee, as I do here in the Senate, join me uh, in making a declaration in that regard. Senator Menendez, it's always a pleasure to have you. Thank you for your time. Thank you.